Well, hey, welcome to church today. We are so glad that you are here, that you are joining us, that you are participating today in what's happening. And so as we get going today, we are a church community and we are a community because you are here, because you are with us. So would you let us know, um, just in the comments, we'd just say hello. We'd love to hear from you today as we're getting going. And uh, if we have not met, my name is Evan. I'm on staff here, we're here with Dave. Yeah, so excited to be with you guys. And it's gonna be a good morning. Yes, it is. And we would love to know where you're watching from. Um, it's one of the things we always love to see. It's um, so cool to see just all the different locations checking in, representing. So whether you're really local in our backyard right here, a little farther away, please share that in the chat. Um, even if you're watching, whether you're live right now or watching later on On Demand, we love to see that. So would you just drop that in the comments wherever you're watching right now, we'd love to know where you're watching from. Yeah, and on top of that, I'm sure uh, no matter where you're watching from or who you're watching with, you could think of some people who it would be good to watch along with as well. And so take some time. You can share that link with somebody you know, whether you're watching live right now or you're watching later on in the week. You can go ahead and share that with somebody so that you guys can chat about it later. You can chat in the chat right now that you could be able to engage with it together. That's right. You know, today, actually, we have a special message from Pastor Sammy. We're actually pausing on our series that we've been going through. And Pastor Sammy is just going to speak to um, everything that's happening in the world, um, to the, what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we're certainly coming together and praying for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. But, um, you know, who do you know who um, is just feeling real heavy right now and could benefit from hearing that message, that message of hope, yeah. um, that message of just hearing from Jesus? And so think about who you could share this service with, who you could invite today, who might benefit from that. And maybe someone invited you. Maybe you're actually joining for the first time and you're trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, we've actually got something coming up that's just for you, don't we? That's right. So we've got Starting Point coming up real soon. That's next week, March 6th, right after the live service for online uh, that you can join us. It's, it's a great way. We did it last month. We do it on the first Sunday of every month. It's a really great way, no matter whether you've been watching for a while online or if you're just checking us out for the first time and you're just kind of curious, hey, I wonder what my next step might look like. Yep. Not only here at Lighthouse, but just in your walk with Jesus. Starting Point's a place where you can kind of come in, have a conversation. Somebody can really get to know you and help you find what that looks like. I mean, I felt like that worked really well last month. Yeah, uh, it was such a great it? time we had. Yeah. Um, you know, really, I felt like it was the starting point that if you're yeah. new, you're like, well, where do I start? We want to give you that one place that you can go to that this is how I get involved. This is how I grow in my faith. This is my first step to take. And so that yeah. is your first step if you're new. Come attend Starting Point with us. The link is on our website on the coming up page. It's on our app. Um, it'll be available if you're watching live in the chat. But please um, come check that out. We want to help you get yeah. involved in this community here. Even, uh, like we had some people come last month and they were like, I don't know if I'm really new. I'm kind of new-ish. I've been coming for a couple months, but I'm still kind of in that spot. So even if that's you, you've been hanging around for a while. Yeah. We'd love There's to There's no get requirement. To know you. It does not have to yeah. be your first Sunday, your second <laughs> survey. You know, we're not tracking how many Sundays you've been around. Um, <laughs> if you feel like you're new, if you feel like you could be more involved, that's a great yeah. starting point for you. But um, really, you know, for all of us, we have a next step that we're called to take in our faith. We're constantly progressing. Our faith is a journey. We're growing. We're becoming more like Jesus. Mm. And so maybe you're not clear what your next step is. Maybe you're not brand new, but you feel like you're not sure what that next step is. We want to help with that too. We want to be available for that. We have a pastoral team that's available to have those kinds mm. of conversations. And um, one of the ways you can take advantage of that is to just text us right now at 443-222-1450. Again, that's 443 222 1450. As always, you can also jump on our website, on our app for LH Chat. Um, but we have a team of people who are here for you for those kinds of questions, for prayer, um, encouragement, whatever you're going through. We want to help you and we're here for you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love being on the chat team and really getting to interact with people, hear their requests, help them find out information that they need for whatever's coming up or whatever they might be looking for. It really is a great experience, and I think you should definitely check it out. Yeah, so please take advantage of that. Also, make sure you're subscribed on our YouTube channel if you're not already, because we don't want you to miss out on things like Simple Church. We just had a brand yeah. new episode. It's just kind of this really short church for the internet, this new series of talks that we're doing with Pastor Sammy. And so that's a great opportunity for you. It's a great opportunity to share church with someone who has not experienced it before. So definitely check that out on our YouTube if you haven't already seen it. But right now, what we're getting ready to do is we're going to move over 
to the sanctuary in just a moment. We're gonna come together, and what we're doing today is we are worshiping the God who created the universe. So wherever you're at, if you have the ability, would you get up on your feet today? Would you join us in worship from wherever you're at today as we come together, as we do this as a church community? You are part of a church community today. So don't forget that, participate, lean into today's service, participate in the comments, join us today, because we're moving over to the sanctuary right now, and we want you to be part of this. Maybe not all of you. My name is Liz Seidel. I have the great privilege, and I mean that, to lead our LH Kids ministry, where those kids back there right now are being told about Jesus. They are being discipled to know who he is and how much he loves him. He loves them. As I was thinking about that this morning, I wanted to give us a, a, a verse as we stand in a couple moments to worship together. We get our hearts prepared. In Matthew 6, verse 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow, store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than they? God loves you guys. And as we stand right now to worship, I just want us to think, maybe maybe we came in here with fears and anxieties this morning about what's going on in the world. I invite you to just, I encourage you to lay those things at his feet, to give, give them to him because he will clothe you. He will clothe you in his confidence, in his joy, in his peace. It is nothing that you can manufacture on your own. So let's go to him right now and tell him how amazing he is and how grateful we are to worship him, to have this opportunity to worship him together right now. Let's worship, family.
the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The exalted Christ, who sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, Lord over all. He has the supreme name. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He is the one Lord, Jesus Christ through whom all things were created and through whom we live. Jesus is Lord of both the dead and the living. He is the Lord upon whom the church calls. He is, <laughs> he is the Lord upon whom the church calls. Jesus is our mediator, our intercessor, our reconciler, and the one who gives us entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has a name above all names because Jesus Christ is Lord. I want us to sing through that again.
how are we? Yeah, I hope a lot better after that. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, friend. Keith Foy, everybody, can we give it up for my man? Love me some Keith. Let me start by uh, just first and foremost, welcoming those of us that are in the room that are joining in with us for the very first time. We just wanna say what an honor and a privilege it is for you to come, be part of. We count you a visitor to the house, not a guest. And uh, our hearts cry our prayer all week long, all the more this morning is that you would experience Jesus in a really, really powerful way. You would connect with him in a deeper way and he'd change your life in a better way. And so uh, we just wanna say welcome. I also wanna welcome those of us that are online. Can we show them some room love? We love you so much. We are no longer just a church in the Bernie. For some time we were, we went through various stages where you would have thought we were exclusive GB, all right? But, but our borders have been stretched and God is doing something altogether amazing. Last week I stood in the foyer at the beginning or after service rather of both and I met couple after couple, individual after individual, listening to stories, backgrounds, contacts, what brought them here. And I was just blown away having walked back to my office, driving home, thinking what Jesus is doing here is altogether incredible. And so if I did get to meet you, it was a privilege to meet you. I'm going to be standing out there I would love to meet those of us that are new in and among us. I feel like every time I'm out there, uh, I I meet somebody new that's been coming for either some time or first time, and it's such an incredible encouragement to hear your story. But with that being said, um, I want to give you some sort of uh, frame of thought as to where we're going this morning. If you've been here with us for any length of time, then you know that typically what we do by way of preaching around here is we work through either what we call series, whether books of the Bible or topics, subject matters that we feel like God's called us to speak to, preach on, work through. And so the season in which we are in is no exception to that rule. Actually, right now we are working through the book of Joshua. And today I was slated to preach on Joshua chapter nine, a sermon that I entitled, Don't Get Played in Jesus' Name. Now, that may make sense if I were to preach that to you maybe this week, record it, or some other time. But it was on Monday of this week that I woke. And as I was laying there, actually just getting up, I had this question. Now, this is gonna sound really super spiritual, but bear with me. I had this question that was ringing in my mind. And the question I knew would lead me to a portion of scripture. And the question that, 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 that sort of rang out was, why do the nations rage? And I, I know that the impetus for that question was that I had read and I had watched and I had listened and I had felt what was taking place in Eastern Europe. And I watched as... Vladimir invaded with this sort of dictatorial attitude that he would rain atrocity down on an innocent nation that would stand alone, but then the implications that would come with that. And I, 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 would, I would have been able to, to sort of process better had it been exclusive to that. Although right now, Eastern Europe, having been there, having an affinity for it, having taught in the Bible colleges there, do know that this is their darkest hour since World War II. But it's not exclusive to what's taking place in the Ukraine, although they're feeling the brunt of it. It even breaches the borders of that. It's even taking place in the South China Sea. It's even taking place as Iran seeks to develop nuclear weapons. It's even taking place in the turmoil and in among Israel. It's a taking place everywhere. Why do the nations rage? We should ask the question, why is there so much upheaval? Why is there so much tumultuous seasons one upon another? Why do the nations rage? And I'm so grateful to tell you that the Spirit of God answers that question. 
And what I wanna do is I wanna read you the portion of scripture that I felt like God led me to. I wasn't able to shake it all week long, and so um, I decided I'm gonna preach on it. That's one of the luxuries of being the pastor. I can preach on what I wanna preach on. And so I wanna preach on it. But what I wanna do is I wanna read it to you first. But as we read it, I wanna do something unique. I want you to stand while I read it. And the reason I'm asking you to stand is because we believe here, contrary to modern thought, that the words of which I'm getting ready to read are the very words of life. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit through the pens of men provided for your and my edification, teaching, reproof, rebuke, and instruction so that we can understand how to see and how to live on this side of glory. The psalmist David says this in Psalm chapter two, beginning in verse one. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. Mm. May God bless the reading of his powerful word. Heavenly Father, today as we spend a few moments together, your people in your house with your spirit, I pray, please God, stir us. Give us a frame to look through as we find ourselves in these perilous times. Give us a perspective that comes from you. Help us see rightly, Lord, so that we can live wisely. Help us, God. We are so dependent and desperate for your spirit. Would you come? Would you illuminate your word to us? Would you stir us? Give us an affection for Jesus that we'll leave here different than when we came. It's in your matchless name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. It is agreed upon by scholars that actually in the original Hebrew, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 were together rather than being bifurcated into one psalm and second psalm. It's actually, it was one continuous psalm. And so it is that ultimately the first portion of this psalm being Psalm 1 is found to sort of have a myopic view of a single individual. It's God's charge over, in this case, a man. And the charge is, is that the man needs to choose the path in which they're going to do life. This is why it says that the wise, in essence, do not choose to walk and sit in the seat of the wicked, walk by way of the scornful, or make decisions according to their own agenda and precepts. But actually, the wise do the opposite. The wise walk upright before the Lord, heeding his counsel, 
sitting on every word, walking in the way of truth. Ultimately, what the psalm is doing is it's saying to the individual, choose which path you're going to do life. To choose foolishly, wickedly, is to choose destruction. To choose wisely and righteously is to choose God and his blessings. And so it has this sort of single individual in view. But then Psalm chapter two sort of zooms out, if you will. And now, rather than being focused on a single individual, it focuses on rulers and kings and influencers and nations, those that sit in ivory towers, and those that have the power to sway cultures and those that have influence and prominence and position. And now it says to them, you got to make a choice as well. But it begins by the Holy Spirit through the pen of King David. It begins by asking a question, a rhetorical question, but a question nonetheless, and a question that we should wrestle with, although God's going to provide us the clear answer. And the question is in chapter one or or verse one, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves. Ultimately, they establish their own footprint. They demand their own territory. They posture as their own sovereignty. And then, and then it says, and the rulers, they take counsel or they conspire together. Why do the nations rage one against another? Why is there such arrogance and ego and, and, and self-promotion? Why is it that a Vladimir would invade an innocent nation as a land grab to enhance his territory? Why is it that as he sees the bloodshed and the innocent people that lie in the wake of one's decision, He's not moved by. Why do we rage? Why is it that NPR said recently that the fastest growing emotion in the Western world and even in the Eastern is anger? Why are you always hearing about another dictatorial leader sort of rising up and getting sideways? Why is it that we rage and we're feeling such unrest and upheaval in and among our culture. It doesn't matter if it's on this side of of, of the Atlantic or that side. Why do people rage? And why do the people plot in vain as if, and then they conspire in and among themselves. You would think that it's sort of this high-level conspiracy as they sort of collaborate, build cohorts and sit in back rooms and talk about how they're going to take more and more whatever. Then the psalmist goes on to say, if you're wondering what they're raging against and all the upheaval and all the turbulence and all the crazy and all the the feeling at any given moment our whole planet could jump the rails, he concludes, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Ultimately, what he just did there is he said, let me show you the root of the rage. Let me show you why there is so much discord. Let me show you why there's wars and rumors of wars. Let me show you why there's so much injustice. Let me show you why there's so much pain and anguish. Let me show you why there's so much brokenness. Because people have conspired against God and his anointed Messiah. So when you're wondering, as Pastor John and Pastor Steve, myself, and anybody else that preaches is saying that, man, it feels crazy out there and you don't have to sort of, you don't have to be even on the front line of it to feel it and to go, something's unhealthy worldwide. The reason is because we as a people have become anti-God. That's why because we're raging against the Lord and his anointed one. Why is it that crime's at an all-time high? Why is it that suicide rates skyrocketing? Why is it that our depression is unprecedented? Why is it that our addiction is through the roof? Why is it that crime is almost unharnessed? Why? 
because we have perpetually moved to more of an anti-God posture. That's why, that's why. Legislation won't fix it, money won't fix it, just say no won't fix it, people won't fix it, politicians certainly won't fix it. There is only one that can fix it. So, so, so what's happening is, is we're feeling it. We're feeling it. And we are adopting rapidly, but clearly, a mentality, a culture over, both in the Western world and certainly in the East, that we now live under the perspective that the less of God there is, the better. This is why almost any institution you consider right now in present day is moving more anti-God. Take government, government right now. Now, I'm not saying all, but I'm saying those. I'm saying that our government has rapidly moved more anti-God. Get them out of this arena. Get them out of our decision-making. Get them out of our regard. Get them out of our places. Take intellectual academics, schools of higher thought, whether liberal university, Ivy League universities, or any university, there is a hostility towards Christianity. That they have grown increasingly more anti-God. Take entertainment. That no matter the trend, the culture, the, the new icon, the new pace setter, we are rapidly moving more anti-God. Take even culture at large, you can feel it that when it comes to the new generation that's forthcoming, my generation, or even those close to, we have promoted an anti-God mentality. This is why right now, it's starting to get sort of unsettling when you're thinking about morality and boundaries that now we have tried to get God out of so many different places, so many arenas, so many establishments, so many institutions, so many structures, so many places of influence. Some have even removed them from the church. There are churches now that the preacher or the pastor will stand and pontificate with pithy, flowery opinion, sort of this Oprah-esque mentality, as if that's going to change lives and God is nowhere to be found. And we're wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute, why do we keep moving from brokenness to brokenness? So much so that some would say, get them so far out because I don't want to be told what to do. At its very core, the psalmist goes on to say this, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Watch this. And they say among themselves, let us burst their, their bonds apart. If you're wondering who the there is, it's God and his anointed. It's God and it's Jesus. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What he's saying is, is that the rulers that conspire, the kings that oversee, the, 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 the prestigious and the, the, the culture shapers and makers, ultimately what they're saying in and among themselves, let us break the bonds of any degree of restriction. And in so doing, they've ascribed to a cultural mentality that most live with right now, and that is, is that God is a bondage maker. That's what he is. When we who follow him know him as a bondage breaker. So what we've, what we've, what we've sold and what we've, what we've drank and what we've convinced ourselves of, why? Because of the prince of darkness has invaded the hearts and the minds of men we actually think, God, what you're doing is you're keeping us from pleasure. What you're doing is you're keeping us from peace. What you're doing is you're keeping us from real joy. What you're doing is, is you're trying to restrict us from not living life to the full. 
And so we've ascribed that, God, you must be a bondage maker. And so they say in and among themselves, let us break the bonds apart. So nowadays you live and the mentality is, you can't tell me what to do. If I want to abort my baby at nine months, nobody has the right to tell me otherwise. And when it comes to sexuality, don't tell me, don't impose upon me, don't cause there to be boundaries and guidelines around me. I'll be who I want, when I want, how I want, where I want, according to how I feel. When it comes to authority, you can have a 12-year-old stand up and, and, and berate and cuss out their teacher with zero recourse. Zero recourse, hands tied, shackled, not able to say anything, lest there be a liability. Hear me, hear me, hear me. And we're convinced of the thought that if we can get out of the bonds of God and we can break the boundaries of his restriction and we can do life on our terms, it'll get so much better. How's that working for us? My God, my God, how is that working for us? And so what we've become is we become rapidly more anti-God and we've tried to remove him from everything and then we suffer the consequence and then we rage more against God. See, let me tell you, this is why, this is why for, 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 for largely in and among the church, we want Jesus, we want Jesus and some would even argue and say that and proclaim that, we just don't want the yoke that comes with Jesus. Here's the problem. When Jesus says to those that he summons to himself, his disciples or his followers, he says in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. He says, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light and for I am gentle and lowly at heart. And he said, and I'll teach you the real rhythms of grace. And you, as a result, as you're yoked with me, you will find rest for your soul. That's what he said the byproduct of his yoke is. When you harness next to me, so just so we understand what a yoke is, a yoke is an apparatus that you would put around two oxen to keep them parallel. So one would go through one side of the yoke, the other would go through the other side of the yoke, so they would pull a straight row as they plowed a field. And they would always put the lead oxen on the left so that if the ox sort of pulled, the other went with, so that they were one accord and they walked in unison. And what Jesus is saying is, is he's saying, here's how this works. Take my yoke upon you because I'm gonna be the lead. And when you follow me and I teach you and I instruct you and I walk with you and you with me, he said, where I'm leading you is, I'm gonna lead you to peace and rest for your soul. But now we say, Jesus, give us the peace, keep your yoke. We don't want the yoke. We don't want the precepts. We don't want the instructions. We don't want the bond. We don't want, the, we, don't, we don't want any of that. We want you only if you come with your blessings, but no restrictions. And he said, so now as a result, the people conspire. So now we've realized, wait a minute, we can't do it on our own. Although many times, if you're anything like me, you think you can. And so you posture as this single individual where meanwhile, we're the ant and God's the creator. And we're like, oh, we'll rival. But then when nations realize, wait a minute, uh-uh, one ain't gonna get her done, we we'll conspire, we'll build more humans, we'll get like 10 of us, 10 of us, and then we'll really revolt against God and his anointed, and then we'll get things done. And so this is why, this is why we're only going from worse to worse. Now, I'm not trying to be a fatalist, but that's probably gonna wind up happening over our next few minutes. But listen to me. But listen to this. This is why Paul writes to Timothy and he says this. But understand this, Timothy, his young counterpart. He said that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Now, hear me. I'm not one of those guys that project that we're in the last days. But if we're not, we're on the waiting list. You know what I'm talking about? I don't add my conjecture nor my projections. I don't know. Only God knows. But it says this, but in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Huh. 
meaning that we'll be infatuated with our own and we'll promote our own. He continues and he says, lovers of money. It's all we talk about. It's all we see. It's all we want. It's all what we pursue. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Scripture says, hell and destruction are never full and the eyes of man are never satisfied, meaning that we always want more. Gimme, 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 gimme. Are you, are you, you feel happier now? No. Gimme, 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 gimme. Are you more depressed now? Yes. Gimme, gimme, never appeased. Never content. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to this. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Having those that say, hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I went to church, you know, back in Christmas. Are you... You, are you a Christian? Yeah, absolutely. I go every, you know, I'm a priester. I go every Easter, you know, Christmas. You know, um, um, do you believe in God? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I was, I was, I was confirmed, you know, way back, you know, when I was, you know, about two days old. You know, I, yeah, 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 yeah. But looking at their life, looking at their life and having no evidence of it, no degree of love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, forbearance, self-control, and the like, none. None wouldn't be able to distinguish them from, from the unregenerated whatsoever. But claiming godliness, oh yeah. Yeah, I go to Lighthouse, absolutely. Yeah, dig it there. Yeah, got good coffee. All right, yeah. All right, leave nothing, nothing same. Having the form of godliness, but denying its power because ultimately there's no relationship with Jesus. It's just a badge worn when convenient. The psalmist says, listen, listen, this is, this is what's happening. And then he says, but as that happens here, there's something else happening there. Like at this very moment, the writer continues and says, but he who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. Ultimately, what he's saying is, as we go sideways down here, as nations rage against nations, as people rival against people, as we revolt to remove God from every facet of culture, he sits in heaven and laughs. What the writer just spoke there by the Holy Spirit through the pen of David, as he said, I want you to consider the posture and his position. The posture is that he's sitting down at this very moment. He oversees all of his creation. The heavens declare the wondrous handiwork of the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth is his footstool. He's watching it. He's sitting down. Know this one thing about God. He's not pacing like, like, like back and forth, like frantic, trying to figure out, wait a minute, I didn't see that in Ukraine coming. Holy cow. I didn't know they were working on an internet. That's crazy. Wait a minute. This new show came out. Man, that's really going to shake. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see that one. There's none of that. He's sovereign. He's in control. He rules. He reigns. He's altogether sufficient and he is absolutely immovable. But the scripture says, not only is he sitting down, he's in heaven. Like he sits on his rightful throne and he laughs. It's not a laugh of mockery. It's a laugh of, oh my gosh, look at them. This is spiritual insanity that the creation would rival the create. You think you can remove me? You think you can get me out? You actually think you could oppose me? I remember one time 
I was reading this and I just came to thought my father, when I was probably like five or six years old, he came home from work one day and he had two sets of boxing gloves. He came in, he gave me a set and he took a set. We went down into the basement where he hung this boxing, you know, punching bag. And down there he had sort of this makeshift gym where he would like work out and I would just sit on the edge of the bench and watch him. He had arms on him like that, big around, all tatted up, you know. He was down there sweating, had a little, you know, like, like, like Kenny Loggins on, you know, just like jamming out, you know. I, I literally, I thought like he was faster than a locomotive, could leap tall buildings in a single bounce and catch, you know, bullets in his teeth. And so it was, he would, he would, he would go down there and he would spar and hit this bag, you know, and I would just be like, that guy, he's incredible. And one time he turned around while I had my boxing gloves on, And they were bigger than me at the time. I had these little arms, you know, I weighed all about, you know, 35 pounds. And dad said, come here and hit me, Sammy. Hit me, hit me. And I came over and I just thought, I'm going for the haymakers, right? I mean, I was swinging as hard as I could. And I'll never forget it. He just looked at me and laughed. I mean, I'm like breaking a sweat, pulling a hamstring, you know, my gloves flop, you know, getting ready to fly off. And I'm swinging and he just laughed. And it wasn't a laugh of mockery. It was a lack, it was a, it was a laugh of amusement. Like, you're, like you're, you're so silly. <laughs> he was unpenetrable, if, if that's how you say it. I couldn't, I couldn't hurt him. And he just thought it was sort of cute. And I remember, I remember he would never lose that laugh. I actually, I think I adopted that laugh to this day, that anytime I get in moments where I'm, I either get a little cynical or, or, or I go, this is crazy. And I, and I do that laugh. The writer is saying that's how God laughs. That he watches the spiritual insanity and goes, this is nuts. But then the laugh changes And the writer says, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king. To the rulers, to the kings, to the nations, to the influencers, to the ivory towers, he now says, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That yeah, you you, you might try to rival, but there is one that is coming that is absolutely all powerful. It's crazy when you think about this, I want you to understand that this generation, this is nothing new, this anti-God movement or this attempt to sort of break the bonds of restriction and eradicate any sense of boundaries. This has been happening since the beginning of time. One notable era of the human race is that of the the, the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire, but it was in and among the Roman Empire that an emperor resided by the name of Diocletian. Diocletian was uh, reigned between AD 284 and AD 305. It was his passion to eradicate Christendom. So much so that merciless, he persecuted, arrested and murdered anybody that would claim the name of Jesus. He thought, he thought, this is my whole life stake. This is everything I'm called to do. He thought that so much that he actually convinced himself that he did it, that he eradicated Christendom and those that would follow the way once and for all, so much so that in 286 AD, he minted a coin and on this coin was his face and in it he removed anything that would have reference to God and he quoted the name of Christianity being extinguished. He would then erect two monuments, Diocletian would, in the cityscape around the the, the, the throne within Rome. Two monuments, one of the monuments had this inscription on it, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximus, Hercules, Caesar, Augusti, they're all names of gods. That's what he was calling himself. He likened himself unto an ancestor of Zeus. And he said, homage to me for having extended the Roman Empire in the East and the West 
and for having extinguished the name of Christians who attempted to bring the Republic to ruin. I've got rid of them. I've got rid of all of them. I've got rid of Christendom. He actually erected a second monument with this inscription on it, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximus, Hercules, Caesar, Augusti, for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ for having extended the worship of the gods. Can I tell you where Diocletian is right now? He's in the dirt reduced to a footnote in the pages of history books. He actually thought he would eradicate Christianity and dethrone the great I am. God sits in the heavens and laughs. And then he says this to us. It says, I will tell of this decree or the decree. The Lord said to me, this is now God speaking to the anointed Messiah, his son, Jesus. This is what he says. The Lord said to me, you are my son. And today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance or your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Wait, 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 wait a minute, Sammy. Mm, that doesn't sound fuzzy and warm. No, 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 no. My God is a God of love. My God's a God of grace. My God's a God of mercy. Oh, he is. Far be it from me to ever uh, allow this pulpit to be filled with the rhetoric that would exclude any mention of God's grace. Far be it from us as a community of Jesus followers and a church of disciples that we would ever neglect the message of grace. It's our only hope. It's the good news unto mankind. It's the gospel that Jesus extended so much grace that he came incarnate, walked in and among us 33 years, and for this penalty of sin on mankind, he said, I'll stand in their stead. I'll be nailed to a tree. I'll be placed in a borrowed tomb, but three days later, I'm coming back, defeating Satan, sin, and death itself once and for all. It is the message of grace, but we have grace. Don't miss this. We have grace because first there was wrath, and we have wrath because first there was holiness. That the God that we sing to and the God that we pray to and the God that we worship and the God that we, that we follow, he is a holy God, a pure God, a perfect God, a righteous God, a sovereign God. And because of that, he looks at the foolishness of his creation with contempt. And the contempt then is satisfied on the back of Jesus when God released his fury on him so that we then could become the righteousness of God, restored to relationship with God, and live with God for all of eternity. Why? Because Jesus took the wrath upon him and gave us, check this out, grace. But hear me. But then he's going to return. Why do we fill the halls of rooms and churches? Why do we lean in with expectation? Why is our hope unshakable and immovable? Why do we look heavenward in a world full of chaos? Why? Because we're awaiting his return. The resurrected king is coming back for his church and his bride. And I know you may sit there and be like, that's crazy. You're right. It is crazy. You actually believe that? Absolutely. I don't believe, I believe everything else going on. There's gotta be a solution. It can't end like this. This is depressing. I mean, 2022, shoot, 
I don't know where you live, but I don't care if it's GB. G, G, there's got to be. A, tell me there's a heaven. <laughs> tell me. I don't care if you're in the dirty or you're in Annapolis, you're in Hesburn Park or wherever. Tell me there's something better than this war-torn world. And what God says is, oh, I've established him and he is coming back, but know this, know this. He's not coming back as sweet baby Jesus. And I... <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. I am not trying to be cute. I want you to know he's coming back with a rod of iron. He's not coming back to play games. He's not coming back as just the God of grace without the wrath. He's coming back as the God that will set to order where we've created disorder. He's the God that's coming back to make all things new. He's the God that's coming back to restore the new Jerusalem and the new earth. He's the God that's coming back for his church. And hear me, I would be a poor pastor and a sorry preacher if we preached all grace and you weren't aware of the wrath. That this is why, this is why Revelations describes his arrival and it says it this way, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. How incredible is that? Like only he knows a certain name that he has. Like it's mysterious and concealed wants to be revealed, but only he knows about it. It says he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, linen white and pure were following him on white horses and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he will tread in the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has written a name King of kings and Lord of lords. The reason around here at Lighthouse, we're pro-tattoo <laughs> is because Jesus has one. He has a big old leg piece. And he's coming back to set the record straight. I just want you to know that on that day, which I feel could happen at any moment, yet it could be a century off. I want us as a community to live this day anticipating that day. This is why Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and he says, awake, O sleeper, and come out of your slumber. That a day of reckoning is coming and the Messiah is returning. So then where, where do we go? Where do we go from here? So, so grateful that the psalmist concludes by saying this. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Be warned, O lighthouse. Be warned, O pilgrim that's following Jesus. 
Be warned, oh, those that just met him for the first time or those that are still considering coming to the faith. Be warned and, and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Meaning the wisest way to live is having a healthy, reverent fear of the king. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not a fear like you constantly live in timidity. Oh no, we get to come boldly before him. We get to rush up into his throne room and bring our prayers and petitions to him. It's a fear that, that, that at first you respect him and you follow him. And the writer goes on to say, kiss the son. Meaning, may your life be lived in adoration to him. He's too big. He's too majestic. He's too grand to deserve anything else. Give your praise to him. Give your life to him and tell him, I want you and your yoke. I don't want you just to save me. I want you to be Lord over me. I don't want your peace without your yoke. I want the rest that comes from being yoked to you to follow you so that one day when I stand face to face with you, you'll know me. He said, kiss the son, lest he be angry and perish, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. Come on. It starts with weight, it ends with grace. Like, listen, you don't have to be an idiot. You don't have to live foolish. You don't have to plot your own course. You don't have to believe your own stupidity like you're sovereign and you owe nobody else regard but you. No, you don't have to do that. But you can choose to do that. But then he says, but take refuge in him run to him and find haven in him because there's not refuge anywhere else. If you find some, come tell me. I'm a good conversation. I'd love to hear about the refuge that you think is eternal and will provide the life that only Jesus offers. I've yet to find anything close to it. Jesus is the King. He is the Messiah. He is the great I am. He is the pathway to peace. He is the sovereign. He is the forgiveness. He is the atonement. He is the pathway to life. He is the refuge. And so the writer says, as you see this war-torn world grow and grow and upheaval and more and people are trying to be anti-God, do everything you can to be pro-God because in the end, it benefits you greatly. Amen. Stand with me. I, um, I want to pray for us. And I so appreciate you allowing me to deviate today. We'll get back to Joshua next week, if the Lord tarries. But I just feel like when there's so much chaos and so much crazy, that every once in a while we need to fix our frame once again so as to how to look at life and to remember who's in control. We don't have to figure this out as we go along. We have one that did that for us. And so the blessing to the church is, is that we have scripture to go, oh, this is how I see. And now this is how I live. And as a byproduct, Jesus gets glory and we get a whole bunch of joy even when it's crazy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that as we watch our nation, people, our globe, Father, grow further and further away from you, I pray, Father, that we would only grow closer. And then that you would use our lives as a testimony to draw people to you. You are our true refuge, God. And one day, 
we're gonna dwell with you in your presence for all of eternity. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that would live this day for that day. And I pray for those in and among us, Father, that are still wondering about all this. Lord, I pray your spirit draw them to yourself. Make them your sons and daughters. I thank you for the confidence that you love them way more than I do. And you're not gonna stop until you get them to you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your matchless name we pray. Amen.
that verse in Psalm 2. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. That's not a, a comfortable thought or place to be, and it's not meant to be comfortable. My six-year-old was asking me questions last night. She went to bed about things that are going on in this world, and the only thing that I could tell her was the gospel. Just laid it all out. Sweetie, this, this world is not, not perfect. Don't get that wrong. It's not meant to be the solution, but heaven is coming, amen? And we have eternity to look forward to. We can fix our eyes on that. And it is so good. So maybe you're feeling a little bit of that fear and anxiousness. We have a prayer team that's up here at the front when we close and they would love the opportunity to speak with you. Maybe you need to hear that gospel preached over you. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. Maybe you wanna know more about what this heaven is. Please don't miss that moment. Come on up to the front. They would love to speak with you. Before we go, I wanna pray us out though. Pray with me. Oh Lord, we love you. I'm thankful for the truth of your word, God, and that it is alive. <laughs> Lord, I pray that the people in this room would walk out of here, myself included, Lord, to live not for ourselves, but to live for your glory. God, this world is ever changing and ever surprising, but you are not surprised at all. And we can cling to you. You are our hope. You are our anchor, God. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you, church. Amen. We do love you guys. It's been such a privilege to be able to worship with you uh, today as you're watching along with us. We're so grateful for you uh, and that opportunity to worship together. Yes, absolutely. And we've really, we've come together today as we always do as a church community. And one of the things that happens as we do that, prayer requests have been shared. So wherever you've been watching today, there's prayer requests in the comments. I just would encourage you, would you take a moment? Would we come together? Would we pray over all those requests that have been shared? Um, you know, Brenda, you shared you have a dear friend. Her daughter is in the hospital right now. Ava's in the hospital. She's undergoing surgery um, at Hopkins. And so we're just going to come together and we're going to pray for her. We're coming together. You know, Cheryl, you asked that we pray for you. You also mentioned, Cheryl, um, that your friend's baby really could use some prayer right now. And so with all of these requests, we're just going to take a moment right now. We're going to come together and we're going to pray over them. Jesus, uh, we just lift up every request that's been shared today as we've come together, as we've done church together, Lord. Lord, you know the needs. You know those who are hurting and the need for healing, Lord, um, the need for peace, the need for comfort, um, um, certainly for all that's going on in Ukraine, Lord, for our brothers and sisters there, just for peace, for an end to conflict, Lord. And so in all of these requests that have been shared, we just come together, we bring them to you, we join together in prayer, God, and we ask that these things be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And, and prayer doesn't have to stop right now. We have people who would love to still be able to pray with you on LH Chat. Absolutely. Which you can check out on our website, on the app, or now you can text us directly by using the number 443-222-1450. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to walk alongside you. Uh, whether you're watching live right now or at any point throughout the week, we'd love to connect with you in the